Good afternoon. Welcome, everybody. It is my honor to greet you all from Prague, and um, it is my special honor and privilege to welcome Professor Linda Woodhead, our main speaker for this afternoon or this evening. Um, my um, task is to introduce our main speaker, um, uh, Professor Woodhead is a British academic uh, specializing in religious studies and sociology of religion. Her research is focused on religion, belief and values in modern societies, the decline of Christianity and the rise of new spiritualities and non-religious commitments. Since 2006, she has been professor of sociology of religion in the Department of Politics, Philosophy and Religion at Lancaster University. Uh, she is an author of many publications, and we will have the privilege and chance to hear um, uh, some of her um, insights and uh, ideas and thoughts in today's lecture, which is entitled The Differentiation and Decoupling of Religion, Spirituality and Values. The United Kingdom is a case study. So, Professor Woodhead, welcome. Thank you for being with us this afternoon. Thank you for the introduction and thank you for the invitation to speak to you and your project. Uh, and I'm looking forward, I'm going to present and then I'm looking forward to some discussion and, and questions. And I've, I've deliberately said that I'm going to focus on the UK because I think increasingly we see that each country is a is a different case when it comes to religion and non-religion. And, you know, I'll be very interested to see how it compares with the, with the different uh, countries that you represent here. So, of course, the UK has got a, um, a broadly Protestant background with, with the Catholic Church as a minority religion and a liberal democratic polity. So that's a distinctness. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. Uh, just uh, uh, please, uh, before you start, and we are eager to hear your lecture, but I promise to some of the other participants to say uh, a very short summary of the entire framework of what we are doing. Just to remind those who yeah. are who have been with us uh, last time or the times before. Uh, dear guests, let me just remind you that we are working within the framework of the three years um, research project um, which is entitled faith and belief of or faith and beliefs of non-believers this uh, project has been sponsored by the templeton foundation and we are besides other things we are organizing a series of lectures with um, uh, some interactive discussion afterwards with leading scholars in the field focusing on different aspects of religiosity and non-religiosity in contemporary world. So that is the general framework, that is the um, broader context of what we are doing. And um, because time is precious and because uh, we are all looking forward to the discussion after the lecture, I don't want to waste uh, time and I would like to ask Professor Woodhead to present her lecture now and we will discuss afterwards. So uh, the floor is yours. Thank you and it's, it's great this project sounds fascinating and the different nations you know this is why I want you to compare with the UK so I look forward to hearing the discussion about similarities and differences. Um, and I want to talk about, I try to make it as relevant to your project as possible because I'm also very interested in, in um, the growing number of people who identify as non-religious, which in the UK is now, it's just a majority, it's just over 50%, and it's uh, nearer, I mean, it's nearer 70% amongst youngest generations, so it's very high, and it's been growing, um, it's been growing steadily each generation, you know, maybe for a century, but now it's, it's very considerable. Um, and I've written about a little bit about initial findings, but now I want to present something that's quite new, which is more my my um, hypotheses and arguments and thoughts about some of some of the beliefs and commitments of of the non-religious. 
And the argument I'm going to make, can you see this all right still? You can see the slide moving. Yes, yeah. yes, everything is all right. Thank you. Okay. Um, so I want my, my starting point is just to point out that I'm working with an understanding of religion as having many dimensions. Um, and this is particularly true of church based Christianity, which the historian of early Christianity, Peter Brown, pointed out that one of the unique things about Christianity as a religion was it, it put together uh, beliefs, doctrines, ethics, ritual, community, you know, all, lots and lots of ingredients into what he called a compact constellation of commitments. So that when you go to church, you get everything that you need, if you like. Uh, and that that tendency has, of course, been um, reflected in other religions. When you get the growth of the idea of world religions and the main world religions, which you get in the modern period under pressures of colonialism and so on, um, all the world religions increasingly try to sort of put together all the dimensions of religion. Peter Beyer makes that point very well in his book, Religions in Global Society, where he looks at how they compete with one another, the big world religions and their leaders. But what I want to talk about is what I see as the unbundling of religion. So all those dimensions of religion that Christianity carefully put together, I think that they're coming adrift, they're decoupling, they're differentiating. Uh, I mean, obviously, if you're talking about a Christian heritage country, this is a much more obvious process. In some countries like China or India, it, it, it never went as far. The bundling up didn't go quite as far. Um, but it's very clear to see in a Christian country the unbundling. So here are some of the dimensions of a, of a religion. I won't read them out, but you know everything from the relationship with God and gods through beliefs and dogmas and rituals and relationships, the community, the tradition that it preserves, uh, the sacred objects and sites. All these elements have been bundled, and I think some of them increasingly are cutting free and taking becoming more autonomous in society. That's what I want to look at two aspects of that. So first of all, how spirituality decoupled from religion, particularly in the um, later part of the 20th century. And secondly, how values have decoupled and values have become an autonomous sphere. Uh, I'm actually going to take those things the opposite way round. I want to start off with the topic of values and how it's, it's more recent, this decoupling, but um, it makes more sense to start with it because <clears throat> we're seeing it right now. So what we're seeing, um, certainly in Britain, uh, also in the North America where I've done a bit of work, and I'll be interested to see if it's the true for your countries. We're seeing values and that word or its equivalent becoming more and more visible and prominent. And it's really quite recent. I really in Britain, this dates to um, only this only this millennium, only the 21st uh, century. Um, and really, you start to see it, particularly in Britain, after about 2010. You see it in corporations and organisations, in commercial organisations. Big companies have very visible value statements now. I just took this off the web. It's Microsoft's portion on corporate values. And here are Microsoft's three values, respect, integrity and accountability. Well, you'll get that every country now, every corporation really has to have such a statement. But you also see it in the educational realm. In Britain, every school that is state funded has to publish its values. They have to publish them on a website so that parents, parents get some choice in schooling, which school they send their child to, so they, they can see what the values are. But it's not just to advertise the school that the values are visible. The values are a very important 
pedagogical tool in the schools. So they're very, a lot of emphasis is put on the values in the classroom for the for the children and the pupils. Here you can see from the kind of graphic that it's for young children in a first level school. And they have happiness, excellence, ambition, respect and togetherness. I have a PhD student who's been looking, she's collected a sample of uh, many hundreds, a, a, a reliable representative sample of hundreds of schools, 500 schools in Britain, and respect is the number one value. Uh, and the others are quite varied. They depend quite a lot on the school. And they're, they're somewhat different between faith schools, Christian schools, Muslim schools, and non-religious schools. In Britain, the state funds all those schools. Here's another example um, at a different school, but you can see respect comes up again, but different ones, responsibility, kindness, honesty, perseverance. Schools set these values for themselves. They might have a consultation, but they choose these values. However, the government, the British government now, since 2014, it, it um, demands by law that all schools promote what it calls British values, which are five values, democracy, rule of law, tolerance, mutual respect and individual liberty. This was very controversial um, in Britain. Uh, there was a lot of um, anger about this. It was seen as a reaction against multiculturalism and uh, a, a security move uh, to try and stop Islamic takeover of some schools. Um, but that is compulsory for all schools to teach those now. Since 2014. It, it also, but it also extends not just um, corporate organisational, it also extends to personal values and individuals. I've just finished a large project for a number of years, collaborative project like yours, looking at 18 to 25 year olds, Generation Z, um, young millennials and their, and their <clears throat> identities and values and beliefs and so on and the importance of values to them I and mean, they, they will tell you what their values are and they're very clear about their personal values and they might be things like this is a website where you can take a test find out what your personal values are the young people very articulate in the USA and the UK about their personal values and increasingly, you know, they'll choose it. They'll choose a university. They will choose a workplace. They'll choose their employment in terms of whether the employer has got the right the values that they believe are important. And um, in in the UK, universities now also publish their values. It's quite recent, um, and more and more parts of society feel this obligation to talk about their values. So values have become a kind of autonomous sphere of discourse and activity and actually um, with some power enforcement often. But why? Why has this happened? Why is it cut itself free from the churches and religion, which used to be the main value providers in society? And in answering that, I want to look at both the organisational and the personal aspects of the question. Well, um, an obvious part of the answer is that the churches lost their moral authority in recent decades. Maybe, for, maybe it's been going on for longer in Britain. The interesting thing, though, is when you think about it, the church is actually, in a way, they kind of accelerated and emphasised their values dimension in modern times. You know, if you think about religious controversies and wars and denominational splits in the past, they were often over issues of doctrine, um, whereas increasingly values have been emphasised by the churches themselves, at least I think since the um, 
maybe the 1960s, 70s. So um, th there's a sort of Christian moralism that arose um, in, in some Protestant groups like Moral Rearmament, which was a, which was a worldwide Protestant group. Uh, it began with the Second World War. And the argument was we don't need to rearm with weapons. We need to rearm with better moral, better morals so that the world doesn't go to war again. In the United States, of course, in the 1980s, you've got the, the increased visibility of more fundamentalist Christianity of the new Christian right. And the focus on the family movement and very strong campaigning against abortion for the traditional family against equal rights and so on. And in the Catholic Church, I think Pope John Paul II was really the one who took this same emphasis on values. He was, of course, trained as a moral theologian himself. He published enormous numbers of books on moral theology and on, I mean, things like his encyclicals like um, Veritatis Splendor, you know, emphasizing the absolute nature of moral truths. Uh, and he and he wrote a great deal about um, the family and motherhood and all sorts of moral topics. So the church, increasingly the ch Catholic Church presented itself as a moral provider, a moral expert. I mean, it, it always had, of course, but um, this emphasis on values kind of became even more prominent than the emphasis on doctrine. But the trouble is that the more you the more you become a, pur a purveyor of morality, the more easily you can be hypocritical and you can lose your moral authority. And this has happened very dramatically in some countries. The most dramatic example um, in relation to the UK, round about the UK anyway, is Ireland, or perhaps in the whole in the whole Catholic world, the most dramatic example is Ireland, where the Catholic Church had m more social and political power than almost any other country um, until it didn't. <laughs> and it collapsed very quickly after the 1980s. And this is a new book called The Best Catholics in the World about how that special relationship between the Catholic Church and the Irish people fell apart so quickly. And of course, a big part of the answer is about the sexual abuse scandals and cover ups, which were exposed from the late 1980s and particularly in the 1990s in Ireland and then in, in many other countries. And now Protestant churches are seeing the same scandals. And this, this, of course, undermines their claim to be moral teachers. Um, but it's not just that. There are other issues like remarriage and and um, after divorce, um, like sex before marriage, you know, where, where social values have been drifting away from church values. So in the UK now, it would be completely accepted. I think if I asked this on a poll, you get kind of 100% yes, you can be good without religion. And um, I have asked about moral responsibility and it shifts to the individual. Here's one question I asked in 2013 on a national survey. Which of the following do you rely on most for guidance as you live your life and make decisions? And overwhelmingly, people say their reason, judgment, intuition or feelings, their own, you know, their own individual. Authority. Religious leaders zero. Nobody looks for authority to religious leaders in Great Britain. And even the, a book, you know, Bible, Quran, to 2%. Science is also very low. God is slightly higher, but not much. So this shift of moral authority to the individual who has to be responsible for their own actions. And of course, in, a, in, in sociological terms, this is all tied up with from a, with a much longer, wider shift from a more from a hierarchical, socially hierarchical to a more democratic society. 
in a hierarchical society, you don't need a lot of values teaching because you know what's right and wrong, depending on your own status. If you're a wife and a mother and working class and you know all those other ascribed social characteristics, they came with their own duties and rules and values. And you didn't need these universal values being spelt out and argued about. And that situation has changed in the UK. That's that's really increasingly the social hierarchies have dissolved since the um, Second World War. Mass education makes a big difference there. Another factor in why the decoupling of values is the way that children are socialised has changed. There's a very good book about this, a small study of about 100 parents, 100 families in the USA by Crystal Manning called Losing Our Religion. And she asks the question, how do non-religious parents bring up their children? And she finds there's no one answer. She, there are about five different ways. Some take them to see every kind of religion. Some don't expose them to any religion. You know, there are lots and lots of different answers. But the one thing she finds common is that there's this imperative to self-define. All the parents she talks to, the non-religious parents, believe it's up to the children to decide for themselves. So they're all hostile to imposing any values, even the parental values. They all say it must be the choice of the child. So we see this shift overall. We see a shift, I think, from morality and moralism, where morality is a more authoritative, objective and non-consultative, non-democratic given system, as in Christian ethics, moral theology, uh, to um, values is the new word. You know, the church didn't talk much about values. It talked about morality and ethics. Values are relational. They're, something's only valuable to somebody else. And the word is used in economics uh, for that reason. And they're more diverse as well, and they're more individual. Like you saw, the values are these words like respect and tolerance, and, and you can put together different packages of these words. This is, what's, this is what I think is, is the new thing. And of course, once you do that, you're going to start to get lots of arguments and clashes. And I think this is the basis of the culture wars that have been a feature uh, of so many countries since the 1960s and later. James Davis and Hunter wrote about that most uh, influentially. Um, and he he argued in, in, in the book Culture Wars that the struggles were over values around the family, the curriculum in schools and universities, what was taught, um, multiculturalism, whether it was good or bad, and the, and the place of religion. Should it be public? Should it be political? Or should it be confined to private life? So value clashes become part of life and um, politicians have to take account of the value clashes. And I think it's not, it's not, we've also seen the Christian, a particular Christian ethic of sacrifice, of agape, self-giving love, has given way in Britain to a live your life ethic. I call it from give your life to live your life. So what is seen as good now is um, not, this is the Christian, the old Christian one is self-sacrifice, service, charity asymmetric values, if you like. Uh, but what, what's taken over, particularly for young people, we found in our study, is a live your life ethic. So the good is living your life, living it to the full, being who you are meant to be and doing what only you can do in this life and respecting other people allowing them to do the same, even if you disagree with them. Um, it's a bit like what Charles Taylor calls the expressive ethic. Uh, he's, he's identifying something rather similar, but I think this has taken over from a more Christian sacrificial emphasis. And so you get this, as values decouple, float free, we're seeing this gulf opening up between the church and religion, which 
in many people's minds stands for the world religions and organized religion and popular values. And the, and the big issues on which this occurs, you can see them in relation to divorce and remarriage, absolutely seen as a good thing, acceptable, but not by the Catholic or the Protestant churches in the UK. Um, baptism, I won't go into the, all the details, but, you know, these are the issues that have been there have been big controversies about between the churches and wider society. And with each controversy, more people drift away from the churches because they don't support what they think is good and right and wrong. So to summarise that first main part of my talk, I've talked about the decoupling of values and religion, how values have gone up and up in visibility in society. I've been arguing um, that it's more a bottom up social movement rather than being led by intellectuals or artists and others. Uh, Charles Taylor tends to emphasise the top down a bit more than I would. And that this, these values are taking over, you know, that dimension of religion has been taken over. It's become non-religious. Non it's been taken out of the hands of the churches increasingly. And this is part of the reason for the rapid decline of the churches in the UK, particularly since the 1980s. <clears throat> I wrote a book about this with Andrew Brown called That Was the Church That Was, which is about how the Church of England. The question is, how did the Church of England from being a national church since the 16th century, how did it collapse in the 1980s and onwards um, and go to be a, a very minority church with only about 2% of people going to church regularly? And part of the answer is about the values gap between the values of that church and more popular values. So in the final part of my talk, I'm going to talk about, um, that's the values and uh, religion decoupling. I'm now going to talk about the spirituality and religion decoupling. But let me just pause in case there's anything anyone wants to ask about the values and religion topic. I might perhaps have a question for clarification. Mm. Um, I noticed um, on the screen um, the phrase, the rise and rise of values. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure whether it is a sort of sophisticated pun mm -hmm. or, uh, or something else. What, yes, what? yes, it's just an, it's just a, an English colloquialism. The, the, the rise and rise means, you know, it keeps on okay. becoming more visible. Okay. Yes. On and on, rise and rise. On and on and on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And it hasn't stopped yet. I think we're still seeing it going on rising. Yeah. My question may be to the values. Can I ask you? Can I ask you regarding the values? Please do. Yeah, my question is, do you think that uh, this process will continue and somehow the big uh, global institutions like uh, the pet guys will take over the moral values from the institution and it will continue that the people will actually not uh, need uh, uh, not need institutions like churches because they will find the values in the big uh, corporate organizations. That's interesting. Um, I, to some extent, yes, you know, insofar as corporations are so powerful and dominant in everyone's life now, and corporations are very strong and clear about their values uh, increasingly, and often now they will enforce them. You know, they have compliance officers to make sure the values are being li lived in real behaviour, not just ideas. Um, so at work, yes. But people will not obey uh, personally, because at the same time as this happens, everyone puts the emphasis on personal choice of my values. So, of course, this can lead to great tension between your workplace values and your personal values. Or it may leave you to leave that corporation and join one with values you find attractive, if you have the, if you have the choice. Okay, thank you. Uh, mirror 
uh, raised his hand. So Mirror, you can uh, unblock your mic and you can uh, place your question, please. Yeah. Hi, it's uh, very interesting and inspiring. Thank you for your ideas. My question may be if you are going to explain that uh, further in your lecture, so just feel free to postpone it for later. But uh, you have mentioned the different uh, different participants or actors of the dialogue. Uh, uh, you have mentioned uh, high church and the moral authority of John Paul II. Is there something uh, which uh, has marked uh, this decline of uh, religion, which can be connected to the dialogue between big religions or religious leaders, or that dialogue uh, of religious leaders was completely absent? Because uh, I live in Slovakia, this uh, uh, region and culture is predominantly Roman Catholic with strong leadership of Roman Catholic Church. So I'm just interested if something similar uh, can be or something analogical can be seen in uh, England or Great Britain, because you have mentioned the example of, of Ireland and uh, I see uh, very many things in common between Ireland and Slovakia. But yeah, the point is that the, the dialogue of uh, religious leaders during this period of uh, of the decline of uh, yeah, religion. Between, do you mean religious leaders? Like John Paul II, uh, yeah. archbishops and uh, theologians and uh, yeah, uh, if they have something to say, because I have seen that uh, that survey you have uh, mentioned, it's completely individual and uh, no role for religious leaders, but I, uh, I'm just uh, curious if there was something like at least imitation of the dialogue of religious leaders in the public. Huh. Well, um, I also I asked a question about which religious li religious leaders do you most admire? Mm -hmm. And uh, number one was the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no Christian leader, but Pope Francis was about third in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, people don't people don't. Um, the fact they don't take them for moral authority doesn't mean they don't admire them. Mm -hmm. So it's not that people aren't listening and maybe, you know, taking into account what they say, but they believe that they have to have individual responsibility for making the decision. So they would never say, I'm doing this because the Pope tells me to. Whereas my grandmother generation, they would, Catholics would say that, you know, this is the teaching of the church and the priest tells me that would have been a reason. It's not a reason anymore. But the church is still, you know, the leaders still have these dialogues and still speak in public and they get publicity and press um, and they may have some influence, but it's people don't like to admit anyway. That's certainly not a reason they would give. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. And I think it, it, it no longer comes with the office. They, it has to be charismatic. So Francis' popularity is because he's a charismatic figure. It's not because he's the Pope. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They have to kind of earn their values and yeah. Show Maybe. that's why the Dalai Lama is number one, because people think he's a good, morally good, charismatic leader, I think. But it's always combination. Who was the second, may I ask you? I'm trying to remember. Who would it have been? Um I'll tell you if I remember. <laughs> it was it was not a Christian figure. The Fran queen? The Fran queen? No, no, no. Francis Rabbi. is the highest. I only put very you know, religious figures. They wouldn't that's true, she is a religious figure, but I didn't put her in the she didn't count. <laughs> oh, um Archbishop Desmond Tutu. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, it was a it was a bishop, yeah. Archbishop. Even a Christian. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, thank you for understanding the first part of my argument about values um, coming loose from religion. And uh, now I want to talk about spirituality coming loose from religion. And this is actually something I researched before researching values. So that this was the first project I ever did. Uh, when I was a young academic uh, and we did the research in 2000 to 2002 and then 
uh, we went back and did another repeat study, just a small one in 2014 to see what had changed. So this, this, the research that this, what my comments are based on was done in this town called Kendal, which is in the north of England. And that's a picture of the high street. It's quite a small town, um, 27,000 people, um, but it's self-contained. You know, it has a school and a hospital and a farmer's market. And you could do everything you want in Kendal, not go anywhere else. So um, um, that's just about the project. Sorry, it's 28,000, the population. And when we were there, there were five researchers. It was a funded project. And the question we asked was, what's happening to religion? We just wanted to know what was happening. And we wanted to look at actual activities. And so we spent a lot of time. It was just before the Internet. So we spent a lot of time trying to find all the churches and chapels, but also all the spiritual groups and the big so face to face groups are what we're looking for the big finding from this was just how much spirituality there was it surprised us it surprised everyone so we, we wrote a book called the spiritual revolution why religion is giving way to spirituality on which presented the findings so i'll just tell you briefly the findings and why the spiritual revolution is um can be misunderstood as a title. I will tell you that at the end. So we looked, in the end, we decided that in Kendall, after we'd done all this research for two years, there were two main types, two main types, um, the churches and congregations, and we called that religion, and so did the people there, and what we came to call the holistic milieu, which is spirituality, which holistic is mind, body, spirit, and believing in the whole person, and the whole person in relation to the environment and the cosmos and ecology. So the kinds of things we're talking about were often one to one. Here's here's a healing um, spiritual practitioner offering Reiki healing, but sometimes there were groups who would meet regularly together. So here's a list. I'm going from A to Z of all the spiritual activities we found and we discounted everything that was that people said was just physical you know if if it, if it was a yoga group which was just about meditation or bad back we we took it out of the list they're not included so everything from you know aromatherapy circle dancing foot massage which had a spiritual element to it that's page 2 Another page of different activities in this small town. And page three. The, the biggest single, uh, some of these are many, many groups. The biggest single one was yoga. That was the most popular, followed by Reiki. Today, I think it would probably be mindfulness. They change quite quickly. They rise and fall quite quickly, these spiritual groups and practices. So then we wanted to find out, well, how many people in town are involved in, in, in a week so we could compare the churches and the, and the congregation. Um, and um, sorry, I haven't got the it doesn't come up because I've had it on an animation. But we found that um, when we did the research, about eight percent of the population were in church on a Sunday. And just under three percent were involved in a spiritual group. So the churches were still in face-to-face -face groups and activities, the churches were still involving more people than the spiritual groups. We also found that the, in the spiritual realm, in, the, in both groups, women were dominant. In the churches, 60% of people in church were women, 40% men. In the spirituality, it was 80% women, 20% men. Um, and however, uh, the churches were declining quite fast and the spiritual, the number of spiritual groups had been growing quite fast since the 1970s. Moreover, if you look at general beliefs, this is, these are figures for UK as a whole. Some beliefs, some spiritual beliefs are still growing, have been growing since the 1950s. So belief in a soul has been growing. Belief in an afterlife 
has been growing. You know, against the secularization thesis, these things are growing. Now, you know, you know, you, you all know about the spiritual but not religious question. I asked this a bit differently and I thought it was too um, leading. So in 2013, I asked the question a bit differently because I put in not you could tick not just spiritual and religious, but also or both. But also I wouldn't describe myself or my values and beliefs as spiritual or religious. That's a more positive option than just saying not. Um, um, so sums means people with some religion, nuns means the non-religious. Um, most people in Britain say I wouldn't describe myself or my values and beliefs as spiritual or religious. Almost half of religious people say that <laughs> and um, two thirds of the non-religious say that. Um, but spiritual is more popular, of course, with the non-religious than religious is. Nevertheless, most people in Britain don't want to self-identify as either spiritual or religious, even if they are Christian Buddhists, you know, go to yoga, whatever. The identity of being religious is not is not a popular one. And the numbers who are actually affiliated to a church or any other religion in Britain have been falling very fast. So if you look at the age, these are my polls in national polls. If you look at the age range on the horizontal axis, blue is Church of England, the biggest historical church. Orange is no religion. So under 20s, minority now Anglican, majority non-religion. Over 70s, majority Anglican minority non-religion. Catholic has been quite steady because of inward migration, particularly from East Europe. These are all the other religions and Christian denominations, smaller ones. But you can see a very clear trend, you know, non-religion increasing every every age cohort and um, Christian and Anglican declining. But now compare that with belief in God or a higher power, and it's not declining nearly as much. So exactly the same age group there on the same survey. These are people who definitely believe, definitely believe in a God. These are people who definitely do not believe, atheists on the right. Um, and in orange, people who think there's probably a God, uh, Grey is don't know, agnostic, and yellow is probably not, but don't know. And you can see, you know, there is some decline. Fewer young people believe in a God, but it's not nearly as big as the decline in the number who would call themselves Catholic or Anglican or Christian. So belief, you know, in soul, in God, in afterlife, those things haven't been declining as much as secularization theory might predict. And that's really what we found in, 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 in Kendall, even though the numbers were relatively small, this is my caveat for it's not a spiritual revolution in the sense that everyone is gonna leave religion and become spiritual, particularly when it comes to face-to-face -face commitment or calling yourself spiritual or religious. Uh, but certain beliefs and practices are growing and continuing to grow. Astrology, magical practices, belief in a soul, belief in an afterlife, belief in God isn't growing, but it's um, not collapsing. So um, even Britain, which looks very secular, if you start asking, it's not as secular as it looks, but this is, but people are dis disaffiliating from religion, from the churches, from organized religion, and interested in spirituality, which is more subjective, personal. They do it for themselves. They can change their practices through the course of life. You know, they don't have to take the package to go back to the whole package of religion. 
they can unbundle it and have the bits they want. And what they particularly want are the ex experience parts, the experiential parts. I think that insofar as the churches stopped giving people a powerful experience of God or the divine or the spirit, they lost a lot of people. So let me sum up and then we can have a discussion. Um, I've been looking at the disaggregation of the functions and dimensions of world religions, how they unbundled. And in particular, I've been focusing on two examples, how values came adrift apart from the churches and how spirituality also came adrift from the churches. It's offered particularly by um, lay people, non-clerical people, often um, sometimes trained, sometimes not, often women uh, different altogether. And they see themselves as facilitators, not authorities. Well, the churches, of course, are part of this picture and they, ha they, they, are, they react, they, they understand what's going on, church leaders do. How do they react to these trends? Partly, as we've seen, they compete to provide values, but increasingly they offer alternative values to mainstream values. So they become less liberal and more conservative about values. If you think about Christian ethics in the 60s and 70s, or even 80s, it was there are lots of liberal ethics and there were theologians like Hans Kung arguing for a more liberal ethic. Well, they, they have been defeated in a way by the more conservative Christian moral theologians. They also try and compete by offering more, my, more direct spiritual personal experience and charismatic renewal in both the Catholic and the Pro Protestant churches is an example of trying to compete with alternative spiritual providers who offer you direct experience of God. They still, where, where do they still have a kind of monopoly? The churches still have a monopoly, even in Britain, on national and civic rituals and religion. You know, when the Queen comes out or when the Parliament begins or when there's um, less and less a tragedy, actually. But, you know, the church still has, it's still recognised as providing national cohesion and civic cohesion. And the one thing the churches still have that people really value, the clergy don't value it, but the people value it, is tradition, um, the church's buildings, the sacred objects, the memories. Um, but insofar as people don't want to be religious, this, this merges into tourism and people like to visit the churches, but not worship in the churches. They certainly don't want to close the churches. So overall, I'm arguing we're seeing increasing pluralism. There isn't one story anymore. You know, uh, there's religion and non-religion and spirituality and lots of mixtures, both personally, in organisations and in society as a whole. There's no one story that explains it all. Uh, this leads to clashes and wars, particularly of values. And values have become much more prominent. So in religion and in politics, politicians have to listen and they have to make clear their value commitments. And also personal identity. People want to ask and know what your values are. And I've been arguing that religion may be declining, but spirituality and magic have been growing and they're part of the competition in the, in the pluralistic religious and non-religious and spiritual society of today. Thank you. That's the end. Thank you very much. Now I open the floor for questions and uh, please everybody who join us online, you can raise your hand uh, or ask the question directly and I will start here maybe. Okay, Professor Tomasz Ali. Uh, you spoke about so many uh, type of spirituality outside of religion, outside of uh, tradition and Christian tradition. Mm. Uh, I wonder uh, if you focus also 
about the Christian spirituality, uh, the spirituality as a core of religion, and the role of uh, the contemporary Christian spirituality. I mean, uh, by the charismatic, by the uh, some um, streams like Tese, Popolare, uh, the uh, Christian movements. So, mm. about this um, uh, Christian spirituality. Yes, no, th this is a very good point because um, there has been a kind of revival of those as well. And these are very um, vital and have been growing movements in the Catholic Church. And yes, they are. They're doing exactly that. Um, they're reviving an ancient spiritual tradition in a, in a way that's uh, open to modern people. And they have been quite successful. And often they are lay led, aren't they? They're led by lay people and in small groups. You know, they have a lot of similarities with the non-Christian kinds of spirituality. Um, there's not, we didn't find much overlap. You know, you belong, if you belong to one of those groups, you don't usually go to one of the alternative spirituality groups. Um, they're quite self-contained very often, but uh, you're, you're exactly right that they have, <coughs> they've benefited by pulling on their own spiritual tradition and, and, and up and modernizing it. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Pavel Barga. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor, for your inspiring talk. I have a question and I have a comment. The question is about methodology, really. Uh, when you spoke about your research in, in northern England, in, uh, in the town of, of Kendal, uh, I would be wondering how representative that town is of all England. Would there be regional differences in different parts of England or speaking about Wales, for example, or other parts of, of the UK? Or would this be pretty much representative of, of the of the whole UK? So th there's a question and, and a comment uh, about about the shift towards values also in, in corporate culture. I was quite surprised and quite shocked even to find out that in in, in business, my, my wife works for a, for a, for an international corporate corporation, and the language uh, of their values is even aggressive in a sense or, or missionizing, be zealous, you know, and this this kind of thing, try to uh, outreach and uh, gain victory for our company. So what what people find as acceptable uh, in terms of values in corporate culture, for example, I doubt that they would find acceptable in, for example, in, in terms of uh, worldviews or, or religion. So that's, that's just interesting to observe. And I would be wondering if you have any comments on that. Yes, that's a great observation, and it's it's true. I think that you know, as values have sort of moved into things like corporations, corporations start to behave a bit more like religions, and they get you know they start to preach. They have a mission. Mm. They, they can be quite fundamentalist about their values, and um, you see them being you know that they would hate to be called the new religious providers, but they're taking that one aspect and being quite uh, evangelical about it um, and that may raise problems um, yes Kendall isn't Kendall isn't it was a case study so we wouldn't say it's representative um, what we we could test what we found against representative surveys so we know that the church attendance level was representative because there'd been lots of other surveys we didn't actually survey we actually went in person I took a busload of students to check the numbers <coughs> in church one Sunday. But we know that was representative. The number of spiritual providers, um, we don't know if that's representative because no one has ever been able to do a similar study anywhere else in Britain. So Kendall, we know Kendall, it's not a spiritual hub. You know, there are some towns like Glastonbury that are known as places which a lot of spiritual people go to on pilgrimage and whatever. Kendall's just an ordinary town. Um, so there's no reason to think it's particularly high or low, but we don't know for sure. You're, you're quite right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Professor Papa Hoshek has a question. <coughs> thank you. But thank you for <clears throat> the second half of your lecture, which was just as inspiring as the first. But I would perhaps 
uh, go a little bit back to the um, to the first half because <clears throat> I'm excited and frustrated with the with the word values. I mean, with the Czech equivalent to it because it is now um, commonly used in public discourses. But I'm still frustrated with with quite high degree of vagueness with that term, uh, the, the Czech word hodnoty related to worth, to something that is of any value, um, is used as an abstract noun and also as, as, as quite fluid and flexible term. It is used much more often by conservative people and by values, it is almost implied that traditional values or conservative values are actually meant. Mm. The more progressive people do not really use that noun so mm. much. And it is not really commonly used um, uh, in public um, debates. Uh, with the exception of, of, of this conservative, progressive, culture war or a mm. culture clash. And, and still, even those who are really strong about affirming values tend to be very vague about what they actually mean by the word. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes it's more like we are talking about the scale of priorities. Sometimes we speak more about, you know, some of the, some of the cultural heritage, which is precious and which is different from some other cultural alternatives that are now, um, um, yeah, presenting it themselves and so on. But is there the mm. same sort of semantic mm. confusion or problem in, 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 in your situation? Economy. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, I mean, it's exactly the same. It's interesting to hear that. Um, but I think that's partly why the word is successful. You know, the vagueness makes it a powerful word because you can use it in so many ways and remain vague. Um, and actually the same is true for spirituality, which is another vague concept. And, um, but it's interesting, you made me think it's interesting, just as when it, when it was first used, spirituality was always used in opposition to religion. It got its meaning by being different from religion. So religion was external and rigid and objective and spirituality was personal and chosen and fluid and all that, you know, so they went together. Um, well, I was suggesting that values has a sort of opposition with morality, but isn't it interesting that people who promote traditional values don't talk about morals and morality. They don't use traditional vocabulary because they're not really traditional. They're modern traditionalists, you know, so the use of values shows that they're, <laughs> they're not really rooted in a moral tradition. They're just as modern as the progressive opponent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Mira. Thank you. My uh, question is a uh, very common uh, common expression nowadays here in Slovakia or Central Europe is the expression traditional values mm. or Christian values mm. as as though those who are not Christians and who are yeah, they are and or those who are not uh, uh, who don't live according to traditional values as though those people had no values mm. uh, they had like uh, empty life and uh, between religion and spirituality, for me there is something, and this is uh, this is something. What is my question about? What is the role of personal faith uh, in, in your in your research and understanding? Is there something in between? Because when I am talking to the people, I see this uh, this discrepancy. Religion is the organized religion. Spirituality is something what is, what is uh, mm. what is very subjective. Yeah. But uh, personal value, when I am looking at biblical, uh, biblical history, biblical culture, this is that Jewish way of life, halakha, and this is the way how I practice. This is that. This is if I am just man, if I am open-minded, if I am like charitable, socially active. 
So uh, is there something, what, yeah, this is that abstract uh, meaning of faith as something intellectual or that living faith, which is rather Jewish. So my question is, is there something in between, between mm -hmm. religion and spirituality? Is there any place for this, what I understand as personal faith, as mm -hmm. opposed to those tra traditional values? Because when I look at uh, religious reformers, they were trying to reform way of life of religious leaders or religious community. So uh, they were very practical and they were actually talking about this, uh, this uh, shift and the necessity to come from that formal to really uh, practical, practical understanding. So what do you think about it? Yes. Um, yes, I think you're right that there is, there is something conceptually between them. Um, I think it's under pressure in society. You know, it doesn't have a big voice. It doesn't have the attention. It doesn't have the media. But um, I was trained in theology originally. There is no such thing as Christian ethics, as you know. There are different ethics and there are arguments and there are debates and there are different strands. Even if you take a simple typology like Ernst Trolch's social teaching of the Christian churches, he differentiates mystical type of Christianity, church-based and sectarian or Bible-based. There, there, there's never been one, there's never been one sort of Christianity. There's never been one kind of Islam. There's never been one kind of, you know, all these things are much more diverse. So as soon as somebody tells you this is Christian values or this is traditional values, you know that they're not really immersed in the tradition. That's, that, that was my point earlier. It's a modern, it's a, it's a modern fundamentalist view that here are the fundamentals and they're unchanging. Well, this isn't true. But th that understanding of being part of a tradition, whether Jewish or Christian or whatever, where it's lived out um, in personal life, in faith, in ritual, and perhaps with some theological reflection, but maybe not. You know, that, th whereas until I don't know when, even when I was young, that was understood as how most Christians were, and that was normal. It's been put under pressure, including by church leaders. This is the argument I made about the decline of the Church of England. That was the normal way of being Christian, having a personal faith. And you only go to church a few times a year. Um, but the church leaders became much more evangelical and said, this isn't acceptable. You know, real Christians have believed these fundamental things. So it's much harder to be in a tradition and have a personal faith than it has been at some points in history. And I think that's why people leave the traditions and go to spirituality where it's possible to go on a personal exploration and you're not going to be criticized. Because if you try and do it in Christianity, a lot of people will say you're not a real Christian and you don't have Christian values. And that's not a nice position to be. So, yes, there is personal faith, but it's not a very good time to. Yes, I see. This. Thank you. Yeah. yeah Professor uh, So, the spirituality as a concept, as a word, is quite modern from the 17th century. And so, uh, the uh, concept of religion was also changing uh, throughout the history and uh, the, our concept religion as a system of uh, faith and beliefs is also relatively modern. It has some connection with uh, uh, the Cambridge school in 17th century and other religion, now the various religions while well, Christianity is one of the religions, it is the concept of uh, it's, uh, Cambridge uh, philosophers from 17th century. But uh, there was always uh, some uh, uh, differentiation between faith and religion or uh, uh, some sense for this inner core of religion and the differentiation between uh, Fides qua and Fides Que uh, from Augustine. Uh, and uh, mm -hmm. I think it's uh, quite interesting uh, this um, 
uh, this um, differentiation now between the Fide square and Fide qua. Uh, because uh, the Fides square, the content of uh, uh, the beliefs, uh, they are in crisis. But the act of uh, faith as a trust, as an ontological trust, I think it's something very important and it's uh, connected with uh, spirituality. So for me, spirituality is the style of a uh, living face, how to uh, how to put face in the practice of my life, uh, also in my spiritual life, but also in uh, uh, in my uh, in my behavior in the society. Mm. So I think both has uh, some inner dimension, a dimension, uh, and uh, it is for me spirituality, the style, uh, how to lift the face. Um, is something more dynamic than just the content of of uh, of, of religion in sense of uh, um, of the dogmas and uh, beliefs and so on. Yes, so I agree with you. Um, this is important, um, but I mean, it's it's also true that for most of Christian history. The people taking the more spiritual path were monastics. They were in monastic orders. And so the challenge for the churches has been to open that up in, to more, in a more democratic way. Um, and there have been some successful examples, but it's, it's, uh, it, it requires a big change and it requires, uh, I mean, in a way, that's what the kind of spirituality we found in Kendall has done more successfully, because it's it's done. Anyone can do it. I can do it. You can do it. We can all set up as a spiritual teacher. We don't need to go through the church hierarchy. We don't need to give up our lives to a monastic community. Or we don't need to be authorized. So if I want if I want spiritual growth, and many people still do, I I'm unlike I won't go to a church. I'm not going to join a monastic order. You know, where will I go? I will go to my friend who's done yoga and meditation and it's accessible to me. But that's I think that's the situation now. And it's it's a missed opportunity in lots of ways that the spiritual tradition. Which people were trying to revive the Christian spiritual tradition in in um, English speaking world anyway, at the beginning of the 20th century. It's It's been happening for a long time, but uh, I think the clergy found it quite threatening that lay people were trying to do that and it hasn't really succeeded in big numbers. Tomas, you wanted to comment? Uh, I just, uh, uh, about this uh, lay people uh, spirituality, I think it was very important in the time uh, when uh, there was a collapse of the uh, religious of the church's system. Like in Middle Age, it was misused uh, the punishment of interdict so something like a general strike of the clergy and for the lay people there was not uh, there were the only chance to find uh, uh, the personal uh, the personal access to religion so it was the time of flourishing uh, the mysticism and uh, and i think something similar is now uh, the uh, system uh, the institutional system of churches in the deep crisis but uh, there is always the need for the spiritual life, and and this is a time of flourishing uh, the interest yes. in spirituality. Yes. So if you if you look at um, Ireland, um, church attendance has collapsed. Attitudes to the church very negative, but some of the practices continue, like going to the holy well, going to the sacred site, um, but. That, that book I mentioned, that he looks at why it collapsed so much. He says you know, it's interesting that there weren't more rituals and practices that people could take home. I mean, if you compare it with Islam or Judaism, they've always had the practices in the home. And, and Islam is extremely democratic. Um, so anyone can pursue the spiritual life in a way that's not been true of the churches. Okay, Professor uh, Thank you. But 
I'm thinking as I'm listening to our discussion about um, some of the phenomena which uh, are quite um, um, strong in our part of the world. I mean, the Czech Republic, but um, perhaps even more in uh, countries like Poland or to some extent Slovakia and uh, other countries where there seems to be a sort of success of some conservative types of uh, religion um, responding to people's need for a firm ground and uh, collective identity and some of those who preach conservative values and traditional values which on the one hand are not very popular really and people are not excited to hear all the things that are forbidden and and so on and so on but on the other hand yeah. there seems to be sociologically speaking an appeal and even some kind of attractiveness of some sorts of conservative religion uh, responding to the identitarian need or the hunger for security and the um, uh, feeling safe under the umbrella of some mm -hmm. kind of sacred order. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm not very happy about that, but I, I think uh, some of these movements are relative, relatively successful. And I, I have read some studies of uh, North American um, church-related um, Christianity claiming that some of the moderately conservative churches actually won over the more liberal ones. Um, I'm not speaking now about Trump and all yeah. that yeah. Uh, horror, but, but the period before. Um, uh, and even some conservative theologians would say, you see our churches are more attractive to people because they really need the sort of security which we offer, whereas you liberals are not really providing people with a sense of um, um, solid orientation in life and so on. So how would you respond to that? Um, I think you're right, it varies in different countries and it varies somewhat depending on whether religion can carry a sense of national identity with it successfully or not. Um, and in the UK, it has not been able to. You know, the churches don't carry a sense of national identity with them. Um, but um, in the United States, the last 20 years have disproved that thesis about strict religion doing better. So amongst young people in the United States, non-religion is growing much faster than in the UK. It's incredibly fast. And some of the best analyses say that it is a reaction against that kind of religion. So I think it might have a short success in some societies, but maybe not a long-term success. One generation may find it very supporting. Their children may rebel against it as, as suffocating them. And I think, I mean, maybe that always happens. Miro said that too. You know, there's often a reaction against very powerful, rigid forms of religion. You get a more spiritual reaction again, don't you? So I think people need to look at a longer historical view to make judgments about that. I don't, I don't believe that strict religion is the answer for the modern world everywhere, at all times, always will be. Uh, okay, Tomas? Uh, I think uh, we should uh, uh, distinguish between, so this uh, secular, uh, modern, progressive Christianity uh, is really not very successful because... Um, yes, correct part of, uh, of the secular society and the people don't know why they uh, should go to the church to listen the same things they yes. are in TV and so on. But uh, there are two uh, very uh, distinguished uh, alternative. One is this alternative of this uh, uh, conservative religion connecting with populism, nationalism, uh, the new religious identity. right, identity, uh, something what I call the Catholicism without Christianity. Mm -hmm. And but uh, 
And there is also another which uh, could, uh, um, uh, could seem like conservative, but it is just the spiritual. Uh, it is not a conservative in the stupid sense. Uh, it is um, the attempt to discover uh, this uh, spiritual uh, dimension of religion. And it is also something what the uh, secular society is not able to offer. Uh, so, uh, I think there are, these two types are uh, relative, uh, relative uh, uh, successful, uh, but uh, the success of this first one, this conservative uh, nationalism, populistic religion, um, is a threat <laughs> for, for the society, but uh, the other, and this uh, discovering the spiritual uh, deep of uh, religion, religious tradition, and so it is something uh, promising, I think. Yes, I think that's all true. And you're correct that strict religion is declining now in the USA, but liberal religion is also declining. Liberal religion has also been a failure. Um, and I think part of the reason was it, it just became values. You know, it lost any spirituality. So if you go to church and all you hear is be nice to people and love your neighbour, you don't get, need to go to church for that. You know, yeah, you can get that from the corporation or from you could just. Yeah. So it, when religion, if religion ceases to put people in touch with the spirit, with God, people will leave because that's the main what's one of the main purposes of religion. You know, it can succeed for a while without that. But when it loses that heart, people go and find it somewhere else. Uh, and that's my story about what happened to spirituality. In the UK, the churches didn't provide that in a way people found meaningful. Both the liberals and the conservatives neither provided what you're talking about. And so they went to other you know, non-Christian providers, but not secular. And they're looking for spiritual experience. Okay, uh, I called always Miro, but this time uh, Dr. Miroslav Kocur with full title. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hosek. Uh, <laughs> my my question my question was uh, how. How far you think, or is there something like evidence for this uh, hypothesis that uh, Christianity can offer a sort of new spirituality? Because you have different smaller groups, you have different uh, communities where even though they are Christians, they live also authentic uh, spirituality. This is not probably going to be the universal at the beginning, but it might become universal value. Because I think that the church has compromised its mission through the history, mm. but at the same time, the 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 basic uh, and, and that uh, content, yeah, that uh, history of thinking, history of ideas. You have many authors who were, let me say, heretics, or they were not accepted, like uh, Erasmus from Rotterdam or. Uh, Mr. Eckhart and uh, Anzel from Canterbury. There were ma many uh, creative creative Christian thinkers or theologians or people who were very spiritual and Christian at the same time, yeah? And they were living their, their faith also in a spiritual way. So they were not like the of, of, uh, ch official church. They were not only uh, power people. They were really people of the spirit. So is there any chance uh, from your point of view for this kind of spirituality, because I like the uh, Tomasz's statement that progressive uh, Christianity has no future because people they will not go to the church in order to listen to everything what they listen on TV. Uh, but at the same time, there must be sort of update like uh, uh, John the twenty third uh, was talking about the update of Christianity, or uh, Pope Francis uh, has also that charismatic. Uh, charismatic dimension and the testimony of his life, history of his life, you see that he's a spiritual spiritual person. So 
is there any chance from your point of view for spiritual uh, uh, spiritual uh, revival uh, on that uh, based on that Christian yeah. uh, Christian content? Um, in some ways, in yeah, some for, ways, well, for me, maybe for me, it's a sort of uh, C.S. Lewis Christianity, that mere Christianity. Okay, let me say. Okay. Well, in some ways, I think there are. In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. You know, in some ways, yes, because um, we have very old Christian cultures, and I think people have a bad relationship with that. You know, it's not good to just leave it behind. Um, and so people one day will want to re-engage with 2,000 years of history. Um, and it has a very rich tradition with huge variety, like you say, and a powerful mystical tradition. So there are many positive things. Um, on the other hand, it has to know because it has to overcome. Um, well, it has to overcome clerical elitism. It has to be for everybody. People don't want somebody telling me how I have to believe and behave and what I should feel. So it has to reinvent itself in a new organizational form, which is not easy to do. And it also has to rid itself, you know, the current form of the churches is all that people know. And so they have an image of the church that is only that. And you know, Christian values are the traditional values, and and it's very hard for young people who aren't brought up anymore in Christian teaching. They just see this on the media or whatever. So there's a barrier. There's a barrier. There's a difficulty of finding a democratic form of Christianity, but there's huge resources and opportunity as well. So it's a mixture. And it would take great charismatic renewal somehow to reinvent and recreate. And when you've got very powerful institutional churches, why, who's going to do it? And they will, they will say it's not real Christianity. This is part of the problem. Our time is almost uh, over, but we have here last uh, question, uh, Pablo. Professor Woodhead, I would like to ask about the UK context. How does immigration from non-European uh, countries? I mean, you spoke about the migration or immigration to the UK from Eastern European countries, keeping the uh, Roman Catholicism steady. But I would yeah. be wondering how uh, immigration from non-European uh, countries has been uh, shifting or changing the spiritual and religious landscape. If if it ha no, it's a very good question, and it has, um, particularly in cities. So London um, is, the, is more religious than the rest of the UK because it's so multicultural. In London now, it's about half white and half non-white and many, many um, different types of African churches and um, Muslim communities and Hindu communities and Sikh communities. And, you know, so in, in London, religion is quite normal, whereas actually in the more white British, eth white ethnic, you know, um, small towns. Um, there's less, it's more, they're more secular now. So where you have a lot of mixing, um, you have more religion. But, but so far there isn't, I think perhaps that makes religion more acceptable or, or, or common. You know, you don't have to apologize. It's not unusual, but there's not much, uh, it's still within your own tradition really, rather than yeah. And your own community. OK, last last chance for question, but I think uh, we are almost done, so we have to finish. Yes, I don't have a question. I just want to express how much I appreciate your wisdom. This was not just a lecture on sociology. This was really uh, very inspiring. Uh, thank you. I'm really impressed. Thank you. Thank you. It's been lovely to talk with you. I think we understand each other. <laughs> Quite the different context. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, uh, 
for me, you changed my concept because I thought that uh, we are very specific here in the CCE, like uh, Central European countries, and now I see the uh, the very same elements uh, even in Great Britain, and I'm so surprised. So I have to um, correct my thinking and <laughs> see, uh, check more the situation in uh, in Great Britain and maybe United States too. And this is um, uh, this is very important. So thank you very much, uh, also for your great um, insights uh, to corporate uh, organizations because this is for me. I never thought about uh, uh, this element, and I, I think uh, it's really. Uh, crucial for understand the situation uh, today and uh, I'm looking forward to the uh, the development like uh, what uh, we can do with your thoughts now and how we can incorporate in our work so maybe we will share with you the uh, the the, uh, outcomes. the outcomes yeah mm -hmm. uh, thank you very much uh, thank you. all participants even the silent uh, silent ones like uh, Jan Jandorek and others, okay? Uh, thank you to all people who will watch this uh, lecture later. And uh, we would like to thank you, Professor uh, Woodhead, for uh, that you accepted our invitation. Thank you very much. And uh, we will be in touch with you uh, later in our research if you will be interested. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. It's lovely to meet you and spend time with you. Thank you for inviting me. Good luck with your project. Thank you very much. I look forward to hearing. Thank you. So, thank you. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs>